All right, welcome to chapter five. Chapter five is all about light and electrons and how electrons move. So we're actually gonna split chapter five up into a portion that we'll take a review quiz over and then a portion that we'll assess over with chapter six. So just know that it's gonna be kind of split in a funny way. So chapter five is about the dual nature of light and about atomic spectra. So we have to first think about what is the atom like. So Thompson came up with the plum pudding model. And so remember that with the plum pudding model, you had a dense positive sphere and you had random negatives scattered throughout. And those random negatives were the electrons. But remember, the whole thing was positive and the negative electrons were scattered throughout. Then you had Rutherford who came up with the nuclear model. Remember he shot the alpha particles at the gold foil and he thought they would go straight through that whole positive sphere but some of them reflected back at pretty big angles. And so he came up with the idea of the nucleus. So you have a positive nucleus in the middle, it's really dense, that's where all your protons are. And then you've just got these electrons that are scattered around the outside. So that was where Rutherford was. And so the question is, what about the electrons? So remember, Bohr had the planetary model. And his model was that you have these positive protons in the middle, and then you have rings, which is where the electrons live. And they're negative. So... This is kind of the evolution of our thought process on what the atom was like. Remember, Democritus at the very beginning thought it was just this solid thing that you couldn't divide anymore. Thompson refined it by finding the electron. Rutherford refined it by finding the proton and nucleus. And then Niels Bohr came up with the planetary model. So... We know that from Rutherford's model, the atom's mass is concentrated in the nucleus and the electrons move around it. But it didn't explain how the electrons were arranged around the nucleus. And it also, and this is a big deal, this doesn't explain why the negatively charged electrons aren't pulled into the positively charged nucleus. Because think about a magnet. If you put a negatively charged electron I mean, excuse me, a negatively charged end of a magnet and you're a positively charged end of a magnet, they're going to come together really quickly. You're going to have to hold them apart. So why don't atoms just collapse? Because the electrons fall into the protons, into the nucleus. So that's when Bohr started lighting things on fire. And when he would heat different elements, he noticed that certain elements emit visible light when they are heated. And it is, <coughs> excuse me, analysis of that emitted light revealed that the chemical behavior of an element is due to its arrangement of electrons. And this is what we are going to talk about for the next two chapters and all the way through chapter eight. So analysis of emitted light reveals that an element's chemical behavior is related to the arrangement of the electrons. That's a big deal. So we're going to pivot and talk about electrons for a while. So we've talked about Bohr, we've talked about the planetary model, and what we're going to notice is that the ground state over here on the left, the electron is on the lower ring. When you heat it, when you add energy, which is heat typically, that electron absorbs that energy and gets excited and it hops up to the next ring. It treats these rings like a ladder. So if it starts on the first ring around the nucleus and it hops up to this ring and then it hops up to this ring, so it hops. What happens right here is the electron gets more and more excited, it has more and more energy, and eventually it's gonna have to release that energy. 
Well, we're looking at the atom. And this was back when there were just a lot of scientists who really wanted to know what an atom did, what electrons did. This was in the late 1800s, early 1900s. Science was moving in leaps and bounds with the Industrial Revolution and with World War I and eventually World War II. And there was a guy named Einstein and a guy named Schrodinger and they had different models of the atom. So the first one, Schrodinger, and yes, this is Schrodinger's cat. We're not going to talk about that. That's psychology. But Schrodinger was a math guy. And basically, he came up with what we call the quantum mechanical model of the atom. And it is based off of some very complex mathematical equations. But what's important is we know electrons are particles, but Schrodinger treated them like waves. When I say waves, I mean waves that go up and down and up and down like that. So he treated the electrons as waves rather than particles. And basically, he said that electrons don't have a specific orbital. This is different than what Bohr said. Bohr said they have their specific orbit. And Schrodinger said, no, they don't travel in specific orbitals. You could probably find an electron in a certain position, but those positions are going to be a lot more like fan blades, and they're going to be demonstrated by a fuzzy cloud. So, what the wave function does is it predicts a three-dimensional region around the nucleus called the atomic orbital. The same thing that Niels Bohr tried to say with the planetary model, except he said, here is where it will be. What Schrodinger did is he said, this is where you will most likely find the electron. So if the nucleus is in the middle of the atom, which is where it is, the electrons are most likely going to travel around the nucleus in a wave-like pattern. I'm going to be more likely to find electrons closer to the nucleus than I am away from the nucleus. So every one of these blue dots represents the likelihood of finding an electron there. So what the wave function does is it predicts where I could find an electron, and we call that our atomic orbital. So the orbital is where the electrons will most likely be. So, Schrodinger did all this math, and he said that electrons are much more like waves. And then there was a guy named de Broglie who hypothesized that electrons, which we know are particles, can have wave-like behaviors. And he predicted that they have wave characteristics. And this is his equation. And we're not actually going to use his equation, but we're going to use the parts of his equation, which are going to be really important. So what you need to know is this weird little upside down Y. It looks like a upside down Y. It is the Greek letter lambda. And that represents wavelength. And I will write it like this. H is Planck's constant, and we'll talk about that in a couple lessons when we talk about particle behavior. M is the mass, and V is the velocity. And that V is for velocity. It can also be written in your book as a Greek letter nu, N-U, and I'll write it like that because it's a cursive V. But according to de Broglie, electrons have to orbit the nucleus in whole number wavelengths. So if you look like orbiting electrons, you're going to, if you look at this and it's got orbiting electrons, they're going to go around the nucleus, but they're going to have to go around the nucleus in whole number wavelengths. You can't have a half number wavelength like you could with a guitar string. They have to go around in whole number wavelengths. So if it's going to take three wavelengths for an electron to get around, it's going to go one, two, three. But it has to meet back up. So that's where I'm most likely to find an electron traveling as a wave.
So there's a guy named Heisenberg. You might have heard of his name before. But what Heisenberg showed is that it's impossible to take any measurement of an object without disturbing it. So think about it right now. If you're at the doctor and the doctor asks you to get on the scale so they can, or the nurse asks you to get on the scale so they can get your weight, they're disturbing you. You're having to get up off of your chair. You're having to move so that they can measure your weight or measure your height. So the, the Heisenberg uncertainty principle, it states that it is fundamentally impossible to know both velocity and position of a particle at the same time. And that's important because with an electron, I can either know where it is, that's position, or I can know how fast it's going, that's velocity. I cannot know both because if I know where it is, I have stopped that electron. Think about it when you're driving your car. If you're driving home from school and your mom calls and she asks you where you are and you tell her that you're on Franklin Pike traveling south and you're passing Brentwood Hills, by the time that you finish telling her that, you've probably already passed Brentwood Hills because the speed limit's 45 and we all go to speed limit, right? But you're already going past it. You have already passed it and you're, ne you're passing that other church that's next to it. So, you can either know where you are, or where, excuse me, where a particle is, or where the particle, or how fast it's going. You can't know both at, in a very precise manner. That is the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. So, I can only know probability. I can know it's generally in this location, and it's generally traveling this quickly, but I can't know both precisely. So that's the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. So where does all of this come into play? Is that Schrodinger came up with some mathematical equations and treated electrons like a wave. De Broglie said they're particles, but we're going to treat them like a wave and we're going to use some mathematical principles to treat them that way. And Heisenberg said, yes, treat it like a wave. Because if you treat it like a wave, you can know most likely where that electron is and how fast it's going. But you can't know precisely where it is unless you stop it. So since that is the, since Schrodinger treated electrons and waves that as waves, we're going to call that the quantum mechanical model. This applied to hydrogen, and that's what he did his equations on, and we can also apply that to many other elements as well. So, that's video 5.1. Thanks so much for your attention.